I'm honoured to be joined today by former FBI special agents, best-selling author and a world-leading expert in body language, Joe Navarro. Joe, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Ah, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I think when I, I sent you an email a few weeks ago, even I appreciated the randomness of it, uh, re- reaching out to a- an expert in body language like yourself. But the reason why is because I think it plays such an important role in fiction and storytelling as a whole. I mean, mm. if you look at like TV and film, like body language is one of the main weapons of an actor uh, to convey how they're feeling or what they're thinking. And right. I suppose with books, we get a little bit more leeway, don't we? Because we can dive into the thoughts of a character. Uh, but I still think that there's a special thing about body language. And for me, it's because if it's only suggested to us what a character's thinking, it's more interesting because we have to think about what yeah. what is that they, they could be pondering. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on your program. Uh, somehow you convinced me to, uh, <laughs> to to do it, and I think in part because I love good writing. I I can appreciate good writing. Uh, you know, people say, "Well, you you've written fourteen books," and I I say, "Well, uh, I'm more of an author than a, a writer." Yeah, I think. Uh, I think writing is a a true skill set because it, it it is both storytelling, but it's but it's also, as you said, how do we convey emotion, right? So we can say, well, the the person looked troubled, or you know, Hillary Mantel would, uh, uh, who sadly passed away, would would say with. The, with with furrowed forehead, he 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 looked down uh, at his shoes or something, and uh, and maybe conveys uh, the sentiment that way. So I, yeah. I have a I have a high appreciation for those who dedicate themselves to writing, and I having read uh, about Hemingway, you know. And how he would uh, sit in front of that typewriter for two, three, four hours just working on one sentence. And, and if you yeah. stop and think about that, it, it it just uh, it to this day, it just it just tells me how much further I, I need to go, because when you think the the old man in the seat was written at the fourth grade level and he won a Nobel Prize for that. Yeah. And then you go back and look at how he wrote that and you realize that he had mastered words but he had also mastered how to convey sentiments and um uh, and and really uh you know I often speak as a as an anthropologist would our species primarily communicates nonverbally. And 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 though we we take it for granted and we don't really pay too much attention to it unless something really stands out. It is what defines great actors. When you look at uh, Marlon Brando or any any living actor, the great ones, you could turn the sound off and you could see it in their faces. Uh, yeah. Exactly what they're feeling, thinking, or uh, or desiring. And yeah. um, and so the y- your audience, uh, y- you know, people who are uh, writers or potential writers, I think to make writing interesting, I think nonverbals is an area that uh, really has to be mastered, as as Shakespeare did. I think it's it's definitely underused. Like you say, I've always thought it was more important than dialogue, arguably. And like you've just confirmed it there, haven't you? That most of the, the communication that we share between us is nonverbal. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, think about it. We things like trustworthiness. We don't ask people if they're trustworthy. We assess it from their body language. We assess whether we're safe around other people based on their body language. We we make this life changing decisions like who we're going to marry based on body language and 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 it's the primary means by which we communicate empathy yeah um so 
it's it's all around us. It's always with us. We just think that our words are important. But I think, as a as any good writer knows, that the the subtle uh, nuance of of human emotion is really conveyed with with nonverbals. I mean, I, I was looking at a period piece last night, and and just the um, the subtle touch of of uh, uh, one hand against the gloved hand of the of the woman. Yeah. Okay. So there's not there's a nonverbal that's that's extremely powerful. Yeah. It, it, it just just that conveys so much information that she didn't move her hand away. Yeah. And uh, and you can draw a lot of inferences uh, from that. So how, how did you find this particular interest in body language? You've had a really interesting career. Is this something that you've always been interested in, or is it something that you've sort of found as you've worked worked your way through life? Yeah, good question. Well, I was born in Cuba, uh, and I didn't speak English. And then when the uh, communists came, we fled, and we were uh, uh, exiled uh, refugees and ended up in uh, in Miami. And just out of necessity, I found that the only language I could trust uh, was the body language. Yeah. Um, that, uh, I couldn't speak English <laughs> and, and I know some Brits would say, well, you still can't mate, but, <laughs> uh, I get that, <laughs> but I, but, I, but body language seemed to make sense to me. It was, it was clean. It was pure. If somebody likes you, you know it. If they don't, you can tell, uh, if they're genuine and so forth. And so I began to rely on it. By the time I got to, to college, um, I, I was studying uh, anthropology um, on my own, and, and I found it that it was fascinating to, yeah. to look at the, the gestures and, and just the, the body language around the world and 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 even though my degree was in criminology, my really my field of study, my dedication was to 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 body language, and um, and it's one of the fortunate things in the United States that uh, uh, you, you you have the freedom to to study whatever you want. Yeah, uh, and and I did, and it interested me. Um, and and the the interesting thing about body language is nobody owns it. Psychologists think they own it, but they don't. Uh, anthropologists think they own it. Uh, ethologists think they own it. It's it's one of those ologies that everybody contributes to, but nobody yeah. owns. And because of that. At least when I was going to university, you really couldn't get a degree in it. So I just took it upon myself to to study it um, for no other reason than just to to please myself. And and you ha and of course you have a tremendous advantage when you can walk into a room and read the room. Yeah. And you can and you, you can see where there's issues, there's concerns, who's getting along, who's not. All, all sorts of, of of things that you can infer from from body language because we evolved as a species to communicate nonverbally principally because at at least for the last three hundred thousand years from the time we were archaic humans we lived in a world where we were small we had no defenses we had no claws. And we were surrounded by large predators, namely felines. Yeah. And we had to communicate silently and effectively uh, and move about in, in a in very silently. So it became our our primary means of communication. We <laughs> you couldn't go through an African savanna going, Hey Charlie, what's going on? <laughs> we we would have died out as a species. Yeah, um, we had to uh, do so uh, very silently, and so we evolved things, which is part of our nonverbal repertoire, such as the freeze response. We hear a loud noise and we freeze in place. 
Yeah. Uh, we hear bad news and we freeze in place uh, because wh whoever made noise uh, attracted the uh, predators and, and whoever ran would initiate the chase trip bite sequence that mm. uh, all fe uh, uh, all cats, all felines uh, um, use to, uh, to catch uh, prey. So those who ran got eaten. Uh, those who, who uh, remained very still got to pass on their genes, and uh -huh. uh, and and thus much of our body language. For instance, the, the celebrations uh, around the world are always up and out, right? We raise our hands when we score a goal. Yeah, and uh, we don't have to be given a memorandum to do that. Uh, it, it's universal that anything that is positive, uh, we use gravity defying behavior. So these these things are hardwired in us um, as, as a species. So I mean, you mentioned there like the, the power of being able to walk into a room and reading it, reading what people are thinking and feeling. I mean, how easy is it to interpret these things? I mean, it, you've devoted your life to it. I mean. Yep. If if someone like a writer, for example, wants to learn a bit more about how to do that, I mean, what what yeah. sort of advice would you give them? Well, th there's a lot of advice. Uh, uh, we'll we'll keep it compacted here because there's yeah. a lot of great books. I mean, uh, everything that uh, Desmond Morris, who I uh, who for a long time lived in the UK, I th I think he lives in Ireland now. Any book by by Desmond Morris, who uh, uh, looks at at the world as a uh, zoologist, is yeah. is is uh, is essential. And, well, any any of my books, if I can mention it, uh, what yeah, everybody is saying, yeah. or the dictionary of body language, which has about four hundred behaviors. What these books can do is help you to 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 say to look at, for instance, well, what can we gain from this area of the body, right? So if you're a, a writer yeah. and you're looking for a way to show that somebody is stressed, but it's very subtle, you know, you could say, well, you know, the 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 muscles of the neck tightened, or his uh, Adam's apple jumped. Yeah. Well, we've seen that before in the literature, but what if you were to say there was uh, moisture began to build up in the little area just below the nose, we call that the philtrum. So those yeah. lines down from the nose, those are the filtral columns. And and it, humans begin to sweat in this little area when we're when we're under uh when we're under distress or um, you know, so somebody said something uh, nasty, and and there was no immediate reaction except for the the wings of his uh, nostrils, yeah, uh, reddened just slightly, and one might even say began to flare. So yeah. th this this could be interpreted as a pre-event indicator. The person's oxygenating, and he's going to take a punch or or something. Nice. So if you if you know the human body, for instance, um, the shoulders, that when we are uh, confident, we tend to uh, raise the shoulders uh, up dramatically and say, "I don't know where you went." Right. You can just, <laughs> Imagine both shoulders going up, hands palm up, and so forth. But how subtle a change it is when you describe somebody and says, and and he and he said, uh, I don't know where they went, but only one shoulder come up came up, and the other one remained low. Well, yeah. that's lack of confidence. So you can you can use it to really heighten the sensation. Yeah. Of of understanding your character, understanding what that character is going through. Uh, for instance, you could have a character that uh, from the from the waist up looks very calm and uh, and very serene during an interview. But under the table, you could you could say, well, and, and he was wiping his hands on his uh 
on his pant leg or his ankle was quivering. Yeah. And 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 then you realize, oh, this guy is masking from from the chest up, which a lot of people can do. Poker players do that, but it's very difficult to mask the whole body. Or, yeah. or even something so so simple, you know, I, I talked about earlier about the hand of the uh, in that period piece where he reached over and touched the woman's um, gloved hand, and and you know you you get a sense for they like each other. Uh, the space between the hands and fingers, for instance, when we when we're confident, the the distance between fingers tends to spread. And when we lack confidence, we we tend to withdraw the fingers uh, together or or hide the thumb. Yeah, that's a really subtle one, isn't it? I've never noticed that one. Yeah, you often see this in at, at carnivals where they put people in this uh, spook house and they're 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 confronted with the uh, spooky things, and when they take a picture of them, you, you see the thumb. Uh, is uh, re uh, retracted, and the reason for that is um, just like dogs uh, uh, tuck their ears in, humans tuck their their thumbs in, so that um, we don't ca uh, they don't catch on yeah. things as we're running through a jungle. Uh, of course, we don't run through a jungle anymore. <laughs> but uh, this was uh, w this was uh, beneficial to us, at least from when we were early hominins about two point four million years ago, yeah. till uh, till about six thousand years ago when we uh, when we entered uh, Mesopotamia. That's crazy, isn't it? I was going to actually ask you about a few of these emotions, Joe, and the typical actions we might see in body language. You've mentioned a few really good ones, but I was going to ask you about dishonesty if mm. someone was trying to hide something. What kind of... Yeah. Dishonesty is really difficult because... But, well, first of all, the research tells us that humans are really lousy at detecting deception. Now, see, now uh, it's bothering me. I said I entered Mesopotamia about 6,000 years ago. I probably <laughs> entered Mesopotamia about Ten to thirteen thousand years ago, but anyway, there's there's a lot that's been written in the literature about deception, and most of it is wrong. The, first of all, there is no Pinocchio effect. There is no way to detect deception accurately using body language. Now, humans are very good at reflecting that uh, what I call in my book psychological discomfort. So in, in my book, What Everybody is Saying, I talk about psychological comfort and discomfort and that we humans, from the time we're born, reflect whether we're comfortable or uncomfortable. And that discomfort, uh, it can be because of the room is too warm, and so we begin to ventilate by lifting our clothing or women lift their hair up. Or because we don't like a question that uh, that we're being asked, yeah. And when when we we are psychologically uncomfortable, uh, we see manifestations that may be anxiety. Uh, it it could be tension, uh, but it can also be uh, dislike and disdain. Uh, you often see this where. I know I have a trouble trouble with this. Every time I go through uh, security at the airport, you yeah. know, and I'm thinking, what is the statistical significance of somebody my age doing something harmful? Yeah, and 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 I know that I, I probably have uh, an annoyed face, <laughs> right? I try not to because these people. God bless them. They're just trying to do their their job, but but I reflect in real time what I'm what I'm feeling. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with harming anybody. It has nothing to do with deception. But we are we do reveal um, our sentiments that way, and uh, and so I would tell writers don't look for a behavior. You know, I remember. 
in the 70s, you would still read a book where somebody said, oh, he touched his nose, and so he's lying, or um, he looked up and to the left, and so he's lying, or he, yeah. he covered his mouth. As a, <laughs> uh, turns out, the honest, uh, as well as the dishonest, uh, do that. But I think if, as a writer, if you want to be authentic and structure it around uh, their responses to questions, that uh, somehow uh, you you can see the psychological discomfort. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Right. So rather than go for a confession, you go for admissions because a hundred admissions. In, a, in the end, equal confession. Now, in the movies, they, they always go for the confession. That, you know, that's so much crap. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I've done over 13,000 interviews. And, yeah, and you, <laughs> you don't set, I mean, yeah, you, you know that eventually, hopefully, you'll get a, a, a confession. But that's not the bar you set. The bar you set is FaceTime. Get the person to talk to you for as long as possible, and eventually, uh, they'll tell you everything. Yeah, and um, and so that's your first uh, objective. But the second one is I always went for little admissions, and what, and so rather than uh, you know, did you shoot her with a Smith and Wesson nine millimeter in the head, <laughs> causing cranial damage? You just gave up so much. Yeah. to work with that even the innocent would sit there visualizing this ma'am and you would see the psychological discomfort and so i would parse it and uh interwoven with other questions i, I might say um almost like uh the old uh, uh in the in the old television show uh colombo yeah. say something by the way do, do you happen to own a gun? Yeah. And and then you pause and you you wait to you wait for the answer but you also look to see what's the reaction to that question. And they may come back and say uh, yes, I I own a uh, a hunting rifle. Uh, oh, okay. Do you own a uh, do you own a handgun? No, I, I, absolutely not. And then you 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 see that the confidence Right, so maybe they answer yeah. that with with a comp with what we call prosody, which is the tone of voice and so forth, and then you may follow up with with another question, like, "Well, have you ever owned a a nine millimeter Smith and Wesson?" Yeah, and you know, so by parsing uh, things, you can look to specific reactions i'll give you another example yeah somebody uh reports finding somebody uh, dead in their house and of course they're under suspicion um i you know i would begin with well when you when you got home where did you park your vehicle did you park it on the street did you park it in the driveway or do you have a, a garage and uh, and then begin to and when you got out of the car did you lock your car did you leave your keys in the car or did you go to the door and and then you go which door was the door locked or unlocked you know and then you take you you see what their reactions are to yeah. each and every question and what happens is they become accustomed to minutia. They don't see it as threatening. But if if somebody, in my experience, if somebody's harboring guilty knowledge, the the incremental technique begins to to you begin to see more and more distress. You may yeah. see the flushing of the skin. You may uh, see, you know, the nervousness and and so forth. Where with the honest, um, they will, as long as this has been your methodology, they will tell you, uh, well, I can't, you know, I can't remember. I must have put the keys in my pocket. 
because I never leave it in the car. And then I went to the front door and, and there, you know, I, I found that the door was actually uh, ajar. And you don't see the psychological discomfort. But when you when you load a question with too many things, uh, then it really loses its validity yeah. as far as being able to assess accurate uh, information. So it's almost impossible. You, you can describe something so horrific that the person for the next 20 minutes will be trying to, you know, clean their brain. Yeah. Uh, of of what you just uh, uh, discussed, and and I've seen uh, I've seen a lot of investigations ruined that way. Yeah, I imagine that because it's so in them interviews, it's so finely balanced, isn't it? It's like a real. Uh, I don't know how you do it. Really, thirteen thousand as well isn't an amazing number. So, I, I and what what kind of things would you be looking for then? I mean, it it, it has to be. I'm guessing. Some of these people that you've had to interview are like masters of deception and it's like a cat and mouse. I can imagine like you're just looking for the tiniest little thing that could just. Well, yeah, that's a good question. Well, first of all, I think you need to get, I wouldn't say there are masters of deception. I, I, I would say that there are people who habitually lie. Yeah. And if they're not questioned, Right. If if I as a person don't do my due diligence and question what they say, then then yeah, they're going to get away with a lie. I remember uh, uh, years ago, I ran into a guy, and uh, my my mother uh, introduced me as a as a FBI agent. She was very proud, and I I really didn't want anybody to know I was uh, you know an FBI agent, but she did. And uh, she said, well, so-and-so, uh, uh, he he had similar work. And I, I go, oh, okay. And uh, what were you? And he, I, he said, well, I, I, was, um, I was in military intelligence. So, oh, that's interesting. And uh, I never believe anything anybody says. Because it, 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 it's not that I shouldn't say I don't believe. It's, yeah. I always remember it's self-reporting, right? Yeah. Well, you can self-report anything. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I followed up with a, 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 really, it was a benign question, but it was pointed. And I said, um, oh, uh, did you work with the 902nd? And he he paused to think for a minute, and he says, yes, of course. And, and so then I invented a, a number. Yeah. Uh, 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 oh, and I said, well, then surely you, you must have worked with the 83rd MI group also. <laughs> and uh, and he said, oh, yes, of course. Uh, very familiar. Well, I just made that up. <laughs> oh, and nice. and as it turns out, this guy had been bamboozling people um, oh, really? in, in this condominium telling them that he was military and I think I never served. I mean, you could just tell, you could just look, uh, take a look at the way he walked that, he, uh, but, but, but yeah, some people just, you know, they, they habitually lie. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't call them on it, but I, I've yet to meet uh, someone who could cognitively uh, keep up with a proper interview because lying uh, places such a cognitive load that you might remember, for instance, I'll give you an example. Here's one your readers will appreciate. A liar will remember the facts he wants to convey, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I came home and I found her dead. Okay. That one's easy. What they, what they don't think about, is the emotions that they felt each step of the way. And that place is a cognitive load. Yeah. And they have to really think hard about, oh, how should I be feeling at this moment? How should I be feeling at this moment? How should I be really feeling at this moment? So a simple question would be, well, as soon as you open the door, um, what did you feel? Yeah. And somebody 
might say, uh, well, I just, I had a sense something was, was wrong. Okay. And then as you, as they reveal that they found a body or whatever, you ask, well, how did you feel at that moment? Now, feelings register, especially strong negative ones, register in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, of which we have two, keep a pretty good record of everything negative. And we evolved that so that we only burn our hands once on yeah, the exactly, stove. Yeah. <laughs> So everything negative goes right to the hippocampus and it stays there. And, uh, and so for the, uh, for the liar, they have to think hard about, oh, what's the emotion I should be feeling right now. And, nice. uh, and that's always an interesting uh, area to, to pursue. Cause I, I've literally had them sit there looking at the heavens thinking, how should I answer this? <laughs> And they don't realize that the clock is ticking. Yeah. And and they're they're thinking. Uh and, and sometimes they'll actually say it as a question. I was uh I was traumatized. Yeah, like not sure. <laughs> like, like, well you either were or you weren't. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll tell you people must have had no chance going up against you, Joe. Well, l let me say this. I I went up against some very good liars. Um yeah. and uh, and 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 I can tell you that they were able to get away with the lies because in in those instances I didn't have access to the evidence, right? Yeah. So I I one of the best liars I ever went up against was a a woman um who uh, committed espionage. She eventually uh, was committed to 25 years but the evidence of everything she said was overseas or in the possession of russians and the russians yeah. weren't being very helpful then and they're <laughs> not being very helpful now and uh and so there was no way for me to contradict anything that she said yeah and she knew it she she said, well, you know, well, you could she was stationed in Germany. She said, well, you could go to Germany and 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 check it out. Well, eventually we did. And it took about six months to catch up with her lies. But it wasn't so much that she was clever at lying. They they flowed from her. Yeah. It was just that we were hard pressed to corroborate everything she said and yeah. and mind you and people forget this that it doesn't matter for, for an fbi agent it doesn't matter if you're honest or dishonest if if you're going to use information from let's say a witness and you're going to go to court you have to corroborate what they said yeah you know if they said i was standing here on this street and i could look down and i could see this happen you have to go out there at the same time of day and and see if you can corroborate that because if you don't defense counsel will so um people think we only corroborate or try to corroborate what the what the bad guys say no we have to corroborate both because yeah otherwise uh well you're an attorney uh yeah. defense counsel will just shove it down your throat yeah. And say, well, uh, Mr. Navarro, did you stand in that corner? No, sir, I don't. Well, did you know that if you look down that road, you can't see anything? Oh. <laughs> Beyond all oh. reasonable doubts, isn't it? Well, it, you know, it, it, it people have uh, faulty memories and, and, yeah. and so forth. And Definitely, they think yeah. they saw, they think they heard. And uh, I, I'll never gaps. forget the, the first time I went to a bank robbery. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. And this was a time when uh, uh, banks, my gosh, they would have six, seven tellers at the same time. Yeah. And uh, I remember taking statements from them, and they all described the gun differently. And I was in shock. I, I always thought that human memory was like a video recording. Yeah. And and you realize that it's not that the person who uh, 
had been directly in front of the bank robber, she described this huge gun. And everybody else who uh, saw the event described the weapon differently. Everything from a six-shot revolver to a to a, a shiny uh, pistol, and I, I, you know, is like, are you serious? <laughs> oh, I had scratch you. <laughs> but uh, but you know, that's that's what you go to court with 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 whatever the witnesses. You know, yeah. so you you go out and you get uh, seven or eight different guns and you put them on a the photo lineup and you try to narrow it down. So, well, I've got so. one final question for you, Joe. Yep. Um, you've written 14 books, is that right? So yes. far. And I know that you mentioned to me that you were starting to look towards fiction writing, which is very exciting because it's got so much experience and insight. I can't wait to read what you're working on. So oh, well, thank you. Yeah, as you've been working on this, how have you applied your experiences and what sort, what advice would you give to anyone out there listening who's looking to utilize body language a bit more in their stories? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, encouraging me because I need it. <laughs> uh, as, as Hemingway said, writing is easy. You sit in front of a typewriter and bleed. <laughs> um, I find writing uh, uh, prose is is very difficult because for 25 years I wrote as an FBI agent, and so writing prose is uh, is very difficult. But I would encourage everyone to include the body language uh, because it it just gives it greater flavor. It it gives it greater nuance. Uh, think of your audience. Right. So there are cultures which are very rich in nuance. Right. So uh, in Asia, Japan, uh, the Middle East, um, much of the Mediterranean countries. And so the gestures, the 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 physical responses. Uh, convey a lot of information uh, where, yes, in certain cultures, words are more predominant, but it just adds so much uh, to it. And it's one of those things that can help you to shape the feelings at the person because because of what we call mirror neurons, right? So if you, if, if you purse your lips, right? in the forward position and then dramatically pull them to the left or right. If you were to sit there and, and study how you feel, you would feel, oh, this really feels negative, or, or I do that when I disagree. It, it just adds more to the description of what a, a person may be feeling. And in the end, it's easy for an editor to take it out if, if, he, do, if he or she doesn't like it or if it doesn't hit the spot. Yeah. Um, but it's so much more difficult to add it in later. Yeah. Um, and so I would I would I would argue, you know, you, you you look at somebody like Hemingway and you know, his language, his his prose was so sparse, but then you you read somebody like F. Scott Fitzgerald or uh Hilary Mantel. And you see the richness of the body language, and you really feel like you're there observing, uh, feeling the uh, the sentiments. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, fantastic, Joe. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. It's it's been an amazing conversation. I think you've been one of my favorite guests on the show, definitely by far. Thank you oh, very well, much uh, uh, thank you. And as I'm looking at your body language, I think you're actually being honest. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get away with that, would you? <laughs> but Joe, how can we find out a bit more about you? Well, you can just uh, plug my name into to to, to uh, Google, and uh, it'll come up. But uh, JoeNavarro.net should get you to my website, and all my books are in the major bookstores and certainly on Amazon. 
And uh, I would encourage uh, them to, uh, yeah, browse browse the books and 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 pick out some some really good uh, body language to convey uh, the, the the feelings. And and I would also add, don't focus so much on the face; those are the easy ones. Yeah, focus on the little things that we do with the rest of our body. Uh, with our hands, uh, uh, with our legs, and so forth, and uh, and add to the to the richness of uh, of understanding your character. Amazing, Joe. Yeah. Thank you again, and uh, thank you everyone right. for listening. <laughs>